Now, the other day I was flying back from San Francisco to San Diego, and I was sitting next to a priest in the plane, and he asked me, what do I do for a living? And I said, well, I study vision, I study perception, how the brain perceives the world. And he said, well, what's there to study? And I said, well, what do you think goes on in my brain when I look at any object? Dr. Villanueva Ramachandran is one of the world's leading brain scientists. He was born in India, but his fascination with the human mind drew him to Britain to study the brain, and then to the world mecca of neuroscience, San Diego, California, where today he's at the forefront of those tackling one of science's ultimate challenges, the mystery of how the human brain works. In this program, he investigates three bizarre disorders of human vision that take him from the consulting room to the outer limits of brain science. Plum cherry banana. I believe it's a banana. No, 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 it's not banana, no. Philip has a problem with the part of his brain that deals with recognition. Well-known personality... I don't know. There's nothing much wrong with his eyes. It's just that he often doesn't know who or what he is looking at. I don't know. I haven't got a clue. David's vision problem is even stranger than Philip's. Although he recognizes the people he knows, they don't feel familiar to him. This leads him to think that the man who looks like his father is in fact an imposter pretending to be his father. He can look like my father, but the fact is that it doesn't feel like him because I know it's not him. It can look identical to him exactly like him, but it's not him. When Ramachandran encounters strange stories like these, he is both a doctor, there to help, but also a detective, on the lookout for clues that might explain the brain science behind such weird experiences. So thank you very much for coming by today. Okay? Thank you for having here. John is epileptic. Frequent seizures in his brain invest everything he looks at with overwhelming significance. Sometimes he even has visions and believes that he is God. I am so blessed. I get to see a glimpse. People say, no, you can't see into the future. Uh-uh. Mm -hmm. you you That's like... what that gift is, man. I see. Okay. That's what that gift is, but you got to pay for it. You gotta pay for it by flopping around and getting slammed around. John, Philip and David have all suffered damage to a region of the brain just behind the temples called the temporal lobes. For Ramachandran, disorders of the temporal lobes not only shed light on how the normal brain works, they also enable us to grapple with questions that have puzzled philosophers since the dawn of history. Ultimate questions like how we come by knowledge of the world. What is it about the particular beauty of a face? And even the question of why we are all prone to religious feelings. But the story begins with the eyes and the very earliest stages of seeing. When I was a medical student, I was taught there's an area in the back of the brain called visual cortex, and that's where seeing takes place. But since then, we have learned, in fact, there's not just one, there are 30 areas in the brain concerned just with seeing. And maybe these different areas are specialized for different aspects of vision. One area for seeing colors, Another area for seeing movement, or form and shape, relative distance and depth. Now, despite this staggering complexity of all these different areas, there seems to be a simple overall pattern of organization. In fact, the visual input as it comes in seems to divide into two parallel streams of processing. There is one pathway which we call the how pathway, to which some of these areas belong, and that how pathway seems to be concerned mainly with navigation, with being able to walk around, avoid bumping into obstacles, be avoiding uneven terrain, reaching out and grabbing something. 
The how pathway leads from the main visual areas to the top of the brain. The other pathway is the what pathway, and this leads from the main visual areas to the temporal lobes. The what pathway is concerned with recognizing the object. What am I looking at? What does it mean for me? Is this an edible object? Is it a flower? Is it a person's face? What is it that I'm looking at and what does it mean for me? That's what the what pathway is concerned with and it's that pathway that seems to be damaged in Philip. One of the first things we learn to do is to recognize and name animals. Camel. Camel? They're camels. I'll hazard the guess they're camels. <laughs> Too late, giraffe. But if I hadn't seen the cypress, then I wouldn't have known. Last summer, Ramachandran was invited to meet Philip in Cambridge to witness a series of tests. He had a hunch that Philip's naming problem was a key to understanding the brain's recognition system. I'm going to be introducing you to Philip, who I've been working with for several years now. Um, back at the, in the late 70s, he was involved in a very serious car accident, and this left him comatose for a number of weeks. And when he actually came round from the coma, it was noted that he'd got problems in recognizing people's faces and also in recognizing animals and fruit and vegetables. History starts for me after the date of the accident because as a result of the accident, my memory is very, very short. Okay, now when you look at, say, an animal, what is your feeling about it? I mean, is it, does it look fuzzy? Does it look out of focus? Or you know what it is, but you can't say it out loud because it's at the tip of your tongue? If I know what it is, but I can't, it's on the tip of my tongue, as you say, but I just can't place it. Although Philip's shattered memory is a severe problem for him, he does manage to lead a relatively normal life. The skin. Now, this difficulty, it's a, it seems to be a relatively isolated difficulty in that he can actually recognise buildings, he doesn't get lost, he drives his way around Cambridge, collects his daughter from school every day. In the first test, Philip is shown pictures of famous buildings, which he seems to take in his stride. That's Cambridge, that's King's College Chapel. He's identified by the bike sitting outside. <laughs> to anybody else, I'm just perfectly normal, because I'm that good at masking over when I'm trying to bluff my way around a situation. I can take you from A to B, no trouble. What's clear is that he's not blind. Absolutely. Um, and this suggests that the notion that vision is one process is clearly wrong. There are all these subtle processes going on in the 30 or odd visual areas that yeah. have been described in the primate brain. And some of these pathways can be selectively damaged. So you get these very, very fascinating deficits where one category alone is affected with other categories being intact. What's this thing? Electric plug. A pair of glasses. Philip is fine with objects. It's with categories of living things that the problems start. See if you can tell me about this one. I know what it is, but I can't name it. Uh -huh. And it's annoying me. Philip's phrase is a bit odd. He says he knows what it is, but he can't name it. But in fact, in most instances, he doesn't even know what it is. This brings us face to face with the mysterious borderland between seeing and knowing, which has always puzzled philosophers. Yeah, yeah, yeah because if you, if you don't know it's a rhino, how can you tell if it's a rhino? If the yeah. teacher's told but if you, you don't know what a rhino is, how do you know what a rhino is? No, but I mean, if the teacher's told you... If you don't know what a rhino is, how do you know what a rhino is? I couldn't have put it better myself. You have just said it all. You've just said it all. Philip's difficulty with the rhino reveals how we learn about the world around us. 
The temporal lobes of the brain where Philip's problem is located seem to house specific memory files that help us distinguish one thing from another. And there are files within files that enable us to tell one animal from another, one face from another face. Philip's accident shattered these memory files. We don't have exactly the same systems involved in recognizing animals and recognizing objects. You happen to have lost the animals part, which in your case, given that you're living in a city and you're a 20th century man, this is not a dire problem. If, however, you were a hunter-gatherer and you weren't quite sure what animal was coming at you, it could be a very serious problem indeed. When he's stumped, Philip often resorts to a roundabout way of solving the problem by trying a Sherlock Holmes-like deduction based on little clues. Golden colour, golden colour, golden colour, golden colour, lions, tigers. They're big, they're obviously vicious because they're caged in. I'll go for lions, but a guess, a big guess. <laughs> I mean, it seems to me what's interesting about all this is there's this tacit taxonomy mm. going on all the time in your brain, this obsessive need to classify things. Help me, girls. What is it, please? It's a, rhino. It's a rhino. And, of course, this is tremendously useful for survival because you need to know it's got holes. whether these animals in general are mean predators. These animals are generally prey. Mm. Here is a mate, not a particular mate, but a potential mate. Now, Philip obviously has problems recognizing many different categories of objects. But the most important category, in many ways, for us humans, because we are such highly social creatures, is interaction between people, which involves recognizing faces. I don't know. I can't place you in any situation. Is it a man or a woman? It's a woman, obviously. Dressed up to look younger. Donald Duck fool, I know. I don't, I don't know. I'm going to try and draw a famous personality on the board and see if you can identify who it is, okay? Now, in addition to his other visual problems, Philip does have prosopagnosia, the inability to recognize people's faces. I don't recognize faces. To get beyond this, I pick up on everything, clothes, hairstyles, nose, Moustache. But Philip's deductive process is not always reliable. Sometimes he misreads a clue and draws the wrong conclusion. Famous movie star? I can't name her, no, but if I'm correct, we're going back to the 50s, 60s. Can you not tell me anything about the expression on your face? Yes, she married into royalty because she married into, oh, what's the country? In Europe, gambling, Monte Carlo. I can't name her. Does she look beautiful to you? Or sort of so-so? Going by that picture, no. But, I fear of, it's of, by her reputation that, yes, she was. Okay. By her reputation that, yes, she was a very attractive woman. Philip is not often this mistaken. Usually, his intelligent alertness to clues sees him through. It's only when he's caught out in the most ordinary situation that it becomes clear how great his loss is. Shortly after we tested him in the laboratory, we engineered a chance encounter with Roz on the street to see if he would recognize her out of context. Do you want me to actually approach him? Yeah. Just go and say hello. Okay. Do that. Hello, Philip. Ross. Got me. Well done. Didn't you recognise me? I didn't, no. It's only when you spoke. Only when I spoke? Only when you spoke, yeah. yeah. If I hear them speak, then I'm in heaven. Because I can identify persons by their voice. Although Philip fails to recognize Roz visually, his auditory recognition system is still intact. As soon as he hears Roz, all the correct associations and feelings flood in. I'll walk straight past you. 
because I don't recognise people. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, just wanted to see It turns out that Philip's flood of emotion plays a vital role in the act of recognition. There are many components to even the simple act of recognizing somebody's face. The most obvious component is the ability to look at that person and know who he is, um, his name, his identity, and what that person means to you. In other words, everything you associate with conscious recognition of faces. But in addition to that, you have to assign an emotional significance to what you're looking at, especially if it's a face. Is this a terrifying face of somebody who I don't like? Could it be my boss? Could it be an enemy? Could it be an animal like a lion? Or maybe it's something neutral. There is a very rare neurological condition called the Capgra delusion, where the emotional response to who we're looking at gets disrupted. The effect of this on our reaction to familiar faces is extraordinary. David woke up one day convinced that his parents were imposters. David presented Dr. Ramachandran with one of the strangest cases he has ever encountered. Two years ago, David was involved in a terrible car accident while driving back to California from Mexico. There was a problem with the car, and I landed in the highway with my head first. Okay. Like this truck that is coming by. For five weeks, David lay in a coma. Serious injuries led to the loss of his right arm. But to everyone's relief, when he came round, his mental capacities seemed to be intact. He was articulate, he was intelligent, not obviously psychotic or emotionally disturbed. Uh, he could read a newspaper, everything seemed fine except he had one profound delusion. He would look at his mother and he would say, this woman, doctor, she looks exactly like my mother, but in fact, she's not my mother, she's an imposter. She's some other woman pretending to be my mother. <laughs> The injury to the temporal lobes of David's brain had brought on a very rare condition called the Capgra delusion. The Capgra delusion is a tragic revelation of the vital role played by our emotions in the act of recognition. I was cooking dinner and he probably didn't like the food that night. Okay. And, and he said, you know, the lady who comes in the morning, she cooks much better than you. Okay. It's, a, it's that lady, I like that lady very much. <laughs> but the lady was me, of course, all the time. David was also convinced that his father was an imposter. He would say to his dad, you know, I'm sure you would like to meet this guy. I'm going to let you know this man because I'm sure you'll like it. He looks so much like you, but he drives better. He doesn't go so fast. I would like you to meet him because he looks a lot like you. After two months of this disturbing behavior, David's parents decided to seek help from Ramachandran, who they'd heard had an interest in such cases. But when you looked at the person who looked like your father, what was your feeling? Did it look like there's some other person who resembles your father? Is not really your father, something like that? Did exactly. Yeah. There's a difference of the fact that I know that that person happens not to be my father. Uh-huh. What was going on? Why was this gentleman there who, who looked like your father? If somebody who looks identical right. or very close to my father or my mother, the fact that that person it is not my father or my mother, right? Okay. I don't expect things from that person as I would expect from my parents. No. I got to coma. The teacher today. David didn't only have these upsetting delusions about people. He even believed that his own home was a replica. One day he started getting really angry. I want to go to my house. I want to go to David's house. I want to go to David's house. And we're in the apartment. And I'm just going, what am I going to do? So I decided, I said, okay, David, let's go. So I took him down the stairs. And I went around through the back, came back through the elevator, took him to bring, you know, the same apartment. Yes, okay. 
And I said, this is your house. And I opened the door and I said, okay, ciao. And I just left him there alone. It was the same apartment. And he looked at it and said, oh, yes, this is my apartment. Things like that would happen. Right. And, and then maybe a few days after, he would start the same. I want to go to my house. David's house. This is not David's house. Amazingly, David sometimes referred to himself as the other David, as if his own self were an imposter. The Capgras delusion has been known since the turn of the century, but has been treated as a curiosity, an anomaly. The standard explanation which you find in most psychiatry textbooks is a Freudian one, and the idea is something like this. This young man, like most young people, when he was an infant growing up, he had strong sexual attraction to his mother, the so-called Freudian Oedipus complex. No, I, do, I, want, I, I don't remember I said. But as he grows up, these Oedipal sexual urges towards his mother get repressed, but then along comes a blow to the head, and suddenly and inexplicably, these sexual urges come flaming to the surface, and he finds himself sexually attracted to his mother, and he says, my God, if this is my mother, how come I'm attracted to her? How come I'm aroused? This must be some other strange woman. And, uh, yeah, they spoke in Hebrew, right? He speaks Hebrew. Now, this is an ingenious explanation, but it doesn't quite work. Because I've seen a patient who has the same delusion about his pet dog. He'll look at his pet dog and say, Doctor, this is not Fifi. It looks just like Fifi, but in fact, it's been replaced by another identical dog. So how does the Freudian explanation account for this? Unless you start talking about the inherent bestiality in all human beings or something like that. So what really causes the Capgras syndrome? Well, it turns out that when you look at an object, the message goes to the temporal lobe cortex where you recognize it. But seeing is a multi-level process. After you've recognized it, you also need to respond to the object emotionally. This is obvious when you look at a Picasso or a Rembrandt or any beautiful picture. Even when you look at, say, your mother's face, the appropriate emotional warmth has to be evoked. Or when you look at a lion, you have to be afraid. And all of this is part of the visual process, but happening in a different part of the brain. Whenever we look at an object or a face, the message reaches the temporal lobes where it's identified but then it gets relayed to a structure called the amygdala, which is the gateway to the emotional centers of the brain. And it's here that we generate the appropriate emotional response to whatever it is we're looking at. Now, what I've suggested is the message gets to the temporal lobe cortex, so the patient recognizes his mother as being his mother and evokes the appropriate memories, but the message doesn't get to the amygdala because the fibers going from the temporal lobe cortex to the amygdala and to the emotional centers are cut as a result of the accident. Therefore, there is no emotion, there is no warmth. And he says, if this is really my mother, why is it I'm not experiencing any emotions? There's something not quite right here. Maybe see some other strange woman pretending to be my mother. That's the only explanation that makes sense to him given this very strange disconnection between the visual centers and the emotional centers in the brain. Ramachandran's hunch that David's delusions were being caused by the rupture of specific brain circuits was lent unexpected weight when David's mother recalled a strange incident with the phone. We got so tired of him saying, you're not my dad, you're my dad, you're not my mother, you're my mother. We decided, okay, you go downstairs, call on the phone and said, David, hi, and on the phone he would know he was his dad. On the phone he never ever had this problem. Had this problem. So on the phone he'd always recognize on the phone the, as his father. As his father. No problem. When he saw him in person, he would in say, person, You look like my father, but, but you're, you're not, not really my, father. my father. No. I'm waiting for my he would come up and no, I'm waiting for my father. This shows the patient is not crazy. Why would he be crazy in person but not on the phone? The answer is, there's a separate pathway that goes from the auditory cortex, the hearing part of the temporal lobe, to the amygdala. And that pathway was not damaged in David by the car accident. Therefore, when he listens to his father on the phone, there is no delusion. Oh, great. 
This is a lovely example how you can take a completely bizarre neurological syndrome, maybe from the X-Files of neurology, which no one really understood, a person claiming that his mother is an imposter, and then come up with a very detailed explanation in terms of the known anatomy of the brain, saying, here is where the flaw is, and then doing an experiment that takes just an hour to do, and showing that this is what's gone wrong in this patient. Okay, are you comfortable? Mm -hmm. To test his theory about Capgras, Ramachandran arranges to measure David's galvanic skin response, which is the basis of the lie detector test. Whenever we look at something emotionally significant, the emotional centers of the brain prepare the body for action and we start sweating. This causes a big change in electrical resistance across the surface of the skin that can be measured. The prediction is that when people with normal brains look at photographs of people they do not know, they will not respond emotionally, so there will be no change in skin resistance. But a familiar face will prompt an emotional response, and invariably there is a change. Now the question is, what happens with David? If Ramachandran's theory is correct, pictures of his parents will not prompt an emotional response, so the line should remain flat. Now this is also telling you about how all of us, how normal people, respond to faces and to objects, because what happens in this patient is truly extraordinary. The lack of emotional response actually leads him to this very profound illusion that this person is not really his mother. In other words, the lack of the autonomic gut reaction, this emotional response, leads him to an absurd conclusion, overriding what his intellect is telling him. And this tells you how closely linked your intellectual view of the world is to your basic emotional reactions to the world. This lack of emotional response to familiar faces can feel extremely unpleasant. Oliver is another rare Capgra patient, living in London. A few months ago, he woke up convinced that the woman in bed beside him was his wife's double. And this double had evil designs on him. When I went out early in the morning, the sky was completely red. I thought it was like the end of the world. So I, I came back in and I got into bed. And uh, my wife asked me what was wrong with me. And when I turned and looked at her, her eyes were red from no sleep, like, you know. And I said, you're a vampire. She said, don't be mad, you know. Like, you feel like sometimes getting in there and giving them a good kick and say, wake up and, you know, whatever. Um, but it wasn't going to happen like that. I said, oh, you were one of them. She said, one of who? <laughs> Delusions as powerful as these suggest that in addition to damaged brain circuits, there may, after all, be a Freudian dimension to the Capgras delusion. This disconnection between the visual centers in the temporal lobes and the emotional centers in the brain cannot be a complete explanation for the full-fledged Capgras delusion in other words, a disconnection must, might be occurring, but how you respond to the disconnection might depend on the particular relationship you had with that person prior to the damage to the brain. You, you know your wife, you're looking at her, talking to her every day, and this person just taking her place, you know? And she's not your wife, and she's, she's trying to convince you that she is your wife. Just because I go out in one set of clothes and come back and change into another. I'm not somebody else. Or if I go out that door, I don't come in as somebody else. But to get him to believe that, I just couldn't. I've had about eight psychiatrists and seven different doctors. I've told them all, like, you know. Oliver's most recent psychiatrist is Simon Fleminger, 
Fleminger agrees with Ramachandran's anatomical explanation of Capgras, but also feels that the condition may be colored by the patient's emotional state. But it was just some, somehow you knew uh, that she was an imposter and wasn't your wife and wasn't to be trusted. Yes, that's right. Yes. One has to be able to incorporate into any model some idea that psychological factors can make the condition wax and wane. And I think one of the fascinations about the condition is how you bring that in, not to displace uh, a physical explanation, but to add to it. What I have tried to incorporate is the way in which what we're expecting to see can affect what we actually see. And if the apparatus that is related to memory function and to perceptions has in some way been damaged by brain injury, and if your expectations are sufficiently strong and powerful, as they might be in somebody who is very, very frightened or suspicious, then in fact what you see is more determined by what you expect to see than what is really going on out there. This is perhaps what's happening in people with Capgra. They get the belief that their wife is not to be trusted. And that then affects how they see their wife. And the result is that they're perceiving somebody who isn't their wife, who must therefore be an imposter. Luckily for Capgra patients, the condition seems to heal itself. Oliver's wife is no longer a vampire, and David no longer thinks his parents are imposters. The man who looks like his father is his father, and triggers the flow of all the old familiar feelings. But sometimes the flow of feeling that completes the act of recognition becomes an uncontrollable flood. For John, this can make the experience of just looking at the world unbearably intense. John has temporal lobe epilepsy. The seizures involve my person and my soul and my spirit, all of it. When I get one of those feelings, so my whole body just tingles and just, oh, I'm like, that's that. John's epilepsy raises the amazing possibility that the temporal lobes of the brain may play a part in the specially intense feelings that we call religious experience. John has temporal lobe epilepsy. The storms that rage through his brain raise the tantalizing prospect that we all might have a kind of God spot. A specialized structure hardwired into our brains that opens us to religious feelings. It has been known for a long time that some patients with seizures originating in the temporal lobes have intense religious auras, intense experience of God visiting them. Sometimes it's a personal God, sometimes it's a more diffuse feeling of being one with the cosmos. Everything seems suffused with meaning. The patient will say, finally, I see what it's all really about, doctor. I really understand God. I understand my place in the universe, in the cosmic scheme. Why does this happen? And why does it happen so often in patients with temporal lobe seizures? My attitude was I was God, and then I had heaven and hell in my eyes. That was it, you know what I mean? I was the, the grand guy who created heaven and hell. John's epileptic seizures are essentially an electrical storm in his temporal lobes when a group of neurons start firing at random, out of sync with the rest of his brain. Recently, John experienced one of his worst episodes to date. For nearly a week, he had eight seizures a day. 
Each seizure lasted about five minutes and involved violent convulsions that left him unconscious. I basically had made plans with an ex-girlfriend to go out to the Salt River in Arizona out in the desert. This girl likes to drink a lot. And to keep up with her, I uh, started drinking vodka martinis and I went into some serious seizures out there. Later that day, John somehow managed to get a call through to his father, who immediately drove out to the desert to bring him home. On the way home, him and I just got into some philosophical, you know, questions about everything, and I just would not shut up once I got on the way home. I was going and going. It was like I was wired. It's basically an earthquake within the body. And like any earthquake, there are aftershocks. Mainly what I deal with is the aftermath, particularly with this last episode. It was very much like stepping into a Salvador Dali painting. Okay, it, instantly everything was surreal. And that's, in essence, what his seizures are all about, the aftermath. Um, where it puts his brain, where it puts his memory, where it puts his mind, his thinking ability, everything else. When John eventually came through this last episode, he was exhausted, but he felt omnipotent. I went running down the street screaming that I was God. And then this guy came out and I was just like pelvic thrust at him and his wife. And I was like, you want an effing bet? I ain't God. And I said, literally, you asshole, get back in here. What do you think you're doing? You made me. Come on Come back on, in. Right. Come on back all in right. now. I'm Come going, on. I'm going. You know, you're disturbing the neighbors, you're going to call the cops. What is this all about? All right. All right, all right, all right. Okay. All right. You're not God. <laughs> I kind of just looked at him cool and calm and apologized to him. And I'm like, no, no one's going to call the police. Like, it, I didn't say this last part, but I'm thinking to myself, no one's going to call the police on God. John was introduced to Ramachandran by his doctor, who knew of Ramachandran's interest in disorders that straddle the boundary between neurology and psychiatry. John had had a recent seizure, which made their encounter very emotional. When I listen to certain types of music, I have this connection with another world, almost. And it's very hard to convey it to another person. Uh, yeah, if you were to ask my dad, he would just say, I am completely through the gateway and into a, another reality 100 percent indeed a separate physical reality is every bit as real to him mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. although it is absolutely nothing like this reality is to us i have looked in his eyes in those times and i have seen seen a cry for help I've been in so much pain that I'd rather be shot to death, dude, or just whipped to death. Mm -hmm. whipped but also, to also death. joy? Yeah, I've Somewhere. been in so much joy that I would rather be left alone. Get, get, take everything away and just let me sit there and have that much joy. I feel like I can float and stuff sometimes, you know? Okay. It's just, it's like... It's like the best. People, people just go, what are you talking? I've done, I've gone, done all kinds of drugs and things and been with, you know, women. And I just go, you don't understand, man. Very first seizure I can remember, he was 17 years old. Okay. So and until 17, he was kind of pretty much like any other kid. He went through the usual adolescent problem. Very much but, so, yeah. But otherwise, was your family, are you religious or is he religious at, before that time? Uh, not, uh, not, no. Now, why do these patients have intense religious experiences when they have these seizures? And why do they become preoccupied with theological and religious matters even in between seizures? One possibility is, well, maybe God actually visits them. But if that's true, as a scientist, I can't test this. There's no way of finding out. 
one possibility is that the seizure activity in the temporal lobe somehow creates all kinds of odd, strange emotions in the person's mind, in the person's brain. And this welling up of bizarre emotions may be interpreted by the patient as, as visits from another world uh, or as God is visiting me. Maybe that's the only way he can make sense of this welter of strange emotions uh, going on in his brain. A third possibility is that this has something to do with the way in which the temporal lobes are wired up to deal with the world emotionally. As we walk around and interact with the world, you need some way of determining what's important, what's emotionally salient, and what's relevant to you versus something trivial and unimportant. Now, how does this come about? We think what's critical is the connections between the sensory areas in the, in the temporal lobes and the amygdala, which is the gateway to the emotional centers in the brain. The strength of these connections is what determines how emotionally salient something is. And therefore, you could speak of a, a sort of emotional salience landscape with hills and valleys corresponding to what's important and what's not important. And each of us has a slightly different emotional salience landscape. Now consider what happens in temporal lobe epilepsy when you have repeated seizures. What might be going on is an indiscriminate strengthening of all these pathways. It's a bit like water flowing down rivulets along the cliff surface. When it rains repeatedly, there's an increasing tendency for the water to make furrows along one pathway, and this progressive deepening of the furrows artificially raises the emotional significance of some categories of inputs. So instead of just finding lions and tigers and mothers emotionally salient, he finds everything deeply salient. For example, a grain of sand, a piece of driftwood, seaweed, all of this becomes imbued with deep significance. Now this tendency to ascribe cosmic significance to everything around you might be akin to what we call a mystical experience or a religious experience. He has a seizure, he'll want to talk philosophy. want to discuss all the things that are floating around in the stew he's got up here that he's trying to reconstruct. Mm. Thoughts that he may have had just, just floating through his mind while he was in a seizure mode uh -huh. may come surfacing. I see. Okay. Also... But also uh, you said he's become more emotional because because of the seizure, so that's, mm -hmm. that's helpful too. Much more sensitive. But oddly enough, not in regards to himself. Okay. 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 But in regards to atrocities, disasters, things like that, anywhere and everywhere. Oh. Wrongs done to other people. Jesus Christ. And Yugoslavia, you know. Yeah. It's, oh, God. But you know what? Yeah. A lot of times I sit there and go, okay, um, there's a reason for ethnic cleansing. Mm -hmm. It's right. And I sit there and totally justify it in my own head. Oh my God, I 100% justified, 100% right for the human race. Oh my God. And you know what? I am so right in my own head, I know I could go out there and get people to follow me. Not, not like these wackos with sheets on their heads. Not like those idiots. But now it's just the new generation of the prophets. Yep. And are, were all the prophets people that were flopping around on the ground? Is that what this whole message was, the gift from the gods this whole time? That's possible, isn't it? Yeah. I've never been religious, ever. The one I compare myself to is Noah and his ark, us saving our earth as a ship. I would say he was a prophet, too, and did something about it, saving everything.
by getting two of each. I just know it's not going to be 40 days and 40 nights, everyone. It's going to be 40 billion years before we're ready to take off in that ship. Ramachandran's proposal that John's intense religious feelings may be the result of faulty wiring in his temporal lobes raises a fascinating question. Might all our brains be in some way hardwired for religious belief? A few years ago, the popular press inaccurately quoted me as having claimed that there is a God center or a G-spot in the temporal lobes. Now, this is complete nonsense. There is no specific area in the temporal lobe concerned with God, but it's possible there are parts of the temporal lobes whose activity is somehow conducive to religious belief. Now, this seems unlikely, but it might be true. Now, why might we have neural machinery in the temporal lobes for belief in religion? Well, belief in religion is widespread. Every tribe, every society has some form of religious worship. And maybe the reason it evolved, if it did evolve, is that it is conducive to the stability of society. And this may be easiest if you believe in some sort of supreme being. And that may be one reason why religious sentiments evolved in the brain. The only reason I probably would get rid of the seizures and epilepsy because I've never even seen them is because of my family, because of him. I would, I would keep them for those visions because of the way I see the world falling into place and things like that. It's a wild little place to, to be stuck in there. But it also seems like a key, and right now I haven't learned how to get to the key without, use the key without those seizures. If I was told that I'd never have a chance to have that key again, sorry, I'm going to hold on to that thing. Just because some patients with temporal lobe seizures have intense religious experiences, this does not in any way invalidate that experience for that patient. In fact, it can very often enrich the patient's life enormously, and it poses a dilemma very often for the physician because what right do we have to treat the patient with medication or with surgery, thereby, in some instances, depriving him of these valuable experiences? To me, the exciting thing is that subjects like God and religion can now be actually addressed by us scientists. We can begin to ask questions about religion and God and begin to approach these questions by listening to these patients, by talking with them, and by studying them. The human brain is without any doubt the most complexly organized form of matter in the universe. The brain is made up of 100 billion nerve cells or neurons Someone has calculated that the number of possible permutations and combinations of brain activity exceeds the number of elementary particles in the universe. And this gives you some idea of the staggering complexity one is faced with in trying to understand the functions of this mysterious organ. So the question is, how do you even begin? A Channel 4 recorded information line with details of organizations offering support on issues like brain injury is available on 08456 10 55. Calls will cost no more than 24 pence and lines are open around the clock until the 13th of June. That's 08456 10 55. Plus, there's an Equinox book on the brain now available. Price, 12 dollars